um, the Bergdahl Endowed Lectureship on Biblical Studies was established in 2012 in honor of Huntington University's Professor Emeritus Cheney Bergdahl for his 37 years of dedicated service to the university and his faithful service to the United Brethren Church. After graduating from Huntington University, Professor Bergdahl served at United Brethren Church in Illinois while pursuing a Master of Divinity degree from Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. Shortly after graduating from Trinity, he was asked to join the faculty at Huntington College, now Huntington University. In 1981, Dr. Bergdahl took a leave of absence from the college to pursue a PhD from Fuller Theological Seminary, which he completed in 1986. Professor Bergdahl returned to Huntington University to complete his career as professor of Old Testament studies. He was my professor, an important spiritual mentor, and a role model for me early in my academic career. Professor Bergdahl passed away earlier this fall. And this evening we are pleased to honor Dr. Bergdahl as we participate in the Bergdahl Endowed Lectureship on Biblical Studies and recognize the wonderful contributions of Cheney Bergdahl to the campus community at Huntington University. Now for tonight's speaker, Dr. David De Silva. For this evening's lecture, we're pleased to welcome Dr. De Silva, the trustees distinguished professor of New Testament and Greek at Ashland Theological Seminary. Dr. De Silva received his bachelor's and master's degrees from Princeton University and his PhD from Emory University in Atlanta. Professor De Silva is an ordained elder in the Florida Conference of the United Methodist Church. He plays the organ and conducts the choir in his home church. Professor De Silva is the author of over 35 academic books and he has been involved in several major Bible translation projects, serving as the Apocrypha editor for the Common English Bible and working on the revision of the Apocrypha for the English Standard Version. So he's certainly equipped to lead us in a conversation this evening about the place of the Apocrypha uh, for us uh, as we think about our understanding of Scripture and our understanding of the early church. Uh, let me lead us in prayer. Father, thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you for the way that you have equipped Dr. De Silva to lead us in thinking about how you have uh, led others to think about you and to write about you and how over the years um, those writings have been brought down to us for our edification. Lord, would you bless our time together this evening. Bless Dr. De Silva as he speaks in Christ's name. Amen. Let's welcome Dr. De Silva. Thank you, Dr. Fetters, for that kind introduction. Thanks to all of you who have come here tonight for that chapel credit you need at the end of the semester. It's a pleasure for me to speak to you tonight about a body of texts that I have found to be of great value uh, in my own work as a New Testament scholar and as a student of Christian history and theology. It's my hope that if you don't already hold these writings in high regard, you will be moved closer to doing so and making it a goal to become familiar with these writings before our time together is over. Just to ask the question, does your Bible have the Apocrypha, is to recall historic controversies among the Christian churches and potentially to summon latent tensions and prejudices between Christian groups to the surface. A reader of a Catholic edition of the Bible will not find a section called Apocrypha. Rather, the books that make up this collection will be found at various places throughout the Old Testament. Catholic and Eastern Orthodox Christians do not refer to these books as Apocrypha at all but rather as the deuterocanonical books, if they make any distinction at all between these and the other books of the Old Testament. A reader of a Protestant or an ecumenical Bible might find, usually between the Old and New Testaments, a section labeled Apocrypha, where these books are collected and housed. The majority of Protestant Bibles in existence today don't contain this section at all, 
and given the choice between, say, an RS, uh, NRSV, a New Revised Standard Version, and a New Revised Standard Version with Apocrypha, most Protestants have tended to choose the former. This might just because it's thinner and cheaper. It might be because they formed a negative judgment on the value of the Apocrypha. I am old enough to remember how, when I was a preteen or a teenager, many of the older Protestants around me knew nothing about the Apocrypha except that it contained books that Catholics believed to be scripture, but that right-thinking Christians wouldn't have anything to do with, such that we are better off without them. All it took for me to know that this opinion was mistaken was for me to actually read these texts. So I'm not going to be coy. I'm here to commend these texts to the attention of all Christians and to do so on exactly the same terms as Martin Luther himself, namely, that they are useful and good to read. Before going too far down that path, however, I'd like to look with you at a case study in the value of these texts and the value of familiarity with them. The teaching attributed to Jesus that I imagine to be most familiar to the greatest number of the world's Christians is the Lord's Prayer, which has been a part of Christian liturgy and piety from the earliest generations. In this prayer, we ask God, forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. In Matthew's Gospel, this is the only petition in the Lord's Prayer that receives further comment by Jesus after he has finished teaching his disciples this prayer. Jesus goes on, For if you forgive people their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive people, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Later in Matthew's Gospel, we encounter the parable of the unforgiving servant, which in itself and especially in its closing commentary on the master's handing over of that unforgiving servant to the torturers till his debt be repaid. Got to avoid the P. Sam, you promised me. Anyway, it further reinforces the teaching of this petition in the Lord's Prayer. In Matthew 18, 35, Thus also will my heavenly Father do to you, unless you forgive each his or her brother or sister from your hearts. When we encounter the Lord's Prayer in its Matthean context, moreover, we encounter it only after a lengthy series of comparative statements in which Jesus recites something that his audience would have heard it was said of old before presenting his own teaching in a way that is typically translated as a contrast. But I say to you, we are set up to think of Jesus' teachings and Jesus' prayer as something new and significantly disconnected from what has come before. Indeed, we can read through the whole of the Hebrew Bible, the Protestant Old Testament, and not find any text that suggests that our experience of forgiveness is contingent upon our willingness to extend forgiveness. Is this then a part of a new revelation about God and God's dealings with us that Jesus had brought to light? Something that set Jesus' teaching apart from the currents of the Judaism of his day? Readers of Matthew, who are also familiar with the wisdom of Ben Sirah, a compilation of teachings from a sage who ran a school in Jerusalem in the first quarter of the second century BCE, would know that the answer to this question is no. This earlier sage taught his students, the vengeful person will experience the Lord's vengeance. The Lord will surely remember that person's sins. Forgive your neighbor a wrong, and then, when you are praying, your sins will be dismissed. Does a person treasure anger against another person and still seek healing from the Lord? He doesn't have mercy on a person like himself, and yet he makes petition concerning his own sins? 
he himself being mere flesh, treasures anger. Who will make atonement for his sins? The rationale for this teaching is clear. Human beings live on a considerably lower plane in the hierarchy of things than God. It would be inherently insulting to God, whose honor is so much greater than our own, if we should expect God to forgive our affronts to his honor, while we, with our considerably inferior dignity, cherish grudges because another human being has affronted our honor. This is essentially the reasoning within Jesus' parable of the unforgiving servant, though expressed using the metaphor of financial debt and emphasizing the incomparably greater deficit in our accounts before God vis-a-vis -vis our accounts with one another on the horizontal human plane. The warning and the assurance given by the Jerusalem sage is moreover precisely that given by Jesus in support of the fifth petition of his prayer. This highlights the first and most obvious reason that all Christians should make time to read the Apocrypha. To do so is to become familiar with resources that shaped the theological reflection and ethical practices of Jews in the centuries around the turn of the era, including Jesus and his first generation of followers, among whom are also the authors that of the texts that constitute our New Testament. This, in turn, allows us to form a more accurate understanding of the relationship of Jesus and those earliest Christian leaders of the Christian movement to the Judaism within which they were nourished. Jesus, Paul, James, and the others whose voices are heard in the New Testament exhibit a much broader and richer rootedness in and appreciation for their contemporary Jewish ethical and theological discourse than the reader only of the Protestant Old Testament will discern. Indeed, if we read only the Protestant Old Testament, we will be liable to regard Jesus and his early followers as standing much further outside of and even against early Judaism than is actually the case. What then are the Apocrypha. The collection known as the Old Testament Apocrypha represents an anthology of Second Temple period Jewish literature written between about 250 BCE and 70 CE, hailing from the land of Judea and from across the diaspora, some composed in Hebrew, others in Aramaic, others in Greek. Two core historical books are 1st and 2nd Maccabees, which jointly recount the history of Judea from about 175 to 141 BCE. These tell the story of the local repression of distinctive Jewish practices in favor of the radical remaking of Jerusalem into a Greek city and the inhabitants of Judea into tolerant polytheists. They tell of the desecration of the Jerusalem temple in the attempt to make it a shrine for multiple gods and the successful revolution by Judas Maccabeus and his brothers that first restores the practice of Judaism and rehabilitates the temple and then leads to the establishment of an independent Jewish state after four centuries of living under the yoke of the Gentiles. These books thereby provide an essential historical and ideological framework for watershed events in Judea that will reverberate through the centuries to follow. First Maccabees shows a greater interest in legitimating the Hasmonean dynasty, the family of kings and high priests that emerged from the last surviving brother of Judas Maccabeus, while second Maccabees focuses more on the persistent truth of Deuteronomy. The Jews fare best as a nation when they faithfully observe the divine covenant given on Sinai. There are also a number of legendary stories, what we might call historical fiction, that seek both to entertain and to promote or celebrate core Jewish values and practices. The Book of Tobit 
tells of God's intervention in the lives of members of an extended diaspora Jewish family, promoting the values of almsgiving, marriage, and care for one's kin. The book of Judith tells of God's deliverance of God's people and their land through a courageous woman, through whom God decisively answers a foreign general's challenge. Who is God but Nebuchadnezzar? Several specimens of wisdom literature appear among the Apocrypha. I've already mentioned the wisdom of Ben Sira, by far the longest writing in the whole collection, written to train the next generation of civil servants and religious leaders in Jerusalem, while also promoting loyalty to the covenant of Moses in an environment in which many Jews are beginning to think that becoming like the nations is a better pathway to flourishing. Another such text is the wisdom of Solomon, written in Greek around the turn of the era. It speaks of the importance of living life with a view to God's post-mortem rewards and punishment. It praises the figure of wisdom, and it retells the story of the Exodus in a way that reveals a great deal about Jewish views of Gentile religion and practice from this period. The centerpiece of the book of Baruch is a wisdom poem celebrating the Torah, the law of Moses, as the incarnation of wisdom, preceded by a lengthy prayer of national repentance and followed by promises of divine restoration. The letter of Jeremiah, which in older editions of the Apocrypha shows up as the sixth chapter of the book of Baruch, is a brief tirade against idolatrous religion written to help insulate Jews, especially Jews living in the diaspora, against the religious practices of the Gentile majority around them, lest the apparent piety that they witness should lead them astray from their exclusive commitment to the one and only living God. A few of the Apocrypha present new versions of or additions to the scriptural story. An expanded version of Esther appears in Greek form, though some of its expansions likely preceded the book's translation from Hebrew into Greek. This version of Esther gives a much larger place to God, to distinctive Jewish practices and prayers, and details about the sources of the ethnic tension in the story that the original Hebrew version uh, leaves out. It particularly does this in six bonus episodes, the so-called additions to Esther, but also throughout the running text in the Greek translation. It is because of those smaller differences that pervade the Greek version that modern editions of the Apocrypha now print the whole of the Greek Esther and not just the additions to Esther, as was the custom back in the uh, printings of the Revised Standard Version and earlier. A version of Daniel, circulating in Greek, offers two additional liturgical pieces, the prayer of Azariah, a prayer of penitence, and the song of the three young men, a celebration of God's deliverance. And it also includes two additional tales, the tale of Susanna and the tale of Bell and the Dragon, not found in the shorter version held to be canonical among Jews and Protestants. This would complete the catalog of the Apocrypha as that collection of texts um, that Roman Catholic Christians include as part of their Old Testament, but Protestant Christians do not have separated out from the Old Testament and allocated to a different category of writing. The Old Testaments of Eastern Orthodox churches, however, contain even more writings than these, and these additional texts tend now to be included in collections of the Apocrypha or Deuterocanonical books out of a desire to be inclusive of all major ecumenical Christian traditions. Among these, we find an additional work of historical fiction, namely 3rd Maccabees, which tells a story of a persecution against the Jews of Egypt, showing their connectedness with the fate 
of the Jerusalem temple and God's nearness to deliver them even as God delivers those resident in the land of Israel. An additional text that falls more or less into the category of wisdom is 4th Maccabees. This text mingles philosophical oration with commemorative eulogy as it promotes Torah observance as the path to attaining the Greek ethicist's highest ideal of the virtuous person, the one who has mastered his or her passions and is therefore free in every situation to act in accordance with virtue. The bulk of that book celebrates the martyrs of the Jewish repression of 167 to 166 BCE as the greatest and most extreme examples of what the Torah-trained person can achieve, hence the book's association with the books of the Maccabees. We also find more in the way of rewritten Bible or expansions of scripture. First Esdras retells the story of the return from the exile, the rebuilding of Jerusalem and its temple, and the reestablishment of the holy seed in the land otherwise found in 2 Chronicles 35 to 36 and parts of Ezra and Nehemiah. The author of 1 Esdras seems particularly invested in elevating the character of Zerubbabel in this story to the complete eclipsing of the figure of Nehemiah, possibly as a way of affirming the continuity of David's line in some form after the exile, since Zerubbabel is a descendant of David. Creative Jewish authors also composed a penitential psalm attributed to Judah's worst king. This is the prayer of Manasseh. And also a psalm celebrating David's selection by God and David's defeat of Goliath, Psalm 151. Key events in David's life that were not represented among the collection of the 150 psalms in our canonical book. Finally, modern collections of the Apocrypha include an apocalypse known as Second Esdras. This is actually a compilation of three different apocalypses, the core of which, chapters 3 to 14, was written by a pious Jew in response to Rome's destruction of Jerusalem and its temple in 70 CE, and wrestling with the problem, not just of that destruction, but of Rome's continuing to flourish unpunished after such an act of desecration. As such, it offers a moving window into how one Jewish author wrestled with these theological challenges, as well as providing a really useful comparative text when studying the book of Revelation, another apocalypse written from about the same time period. The books of the Old Testament Apocrypha, however, are far from the only books written in the three centuries before and during the emergence of the early church. Indeed, some extremely popular Jewish writings that exercised both considerable influence on or authority within a variety of Jewish groups, like First Enoch, quoted in the letter of Jude, verses 14 to 15, or Jubilees, are not to be found in the Apocrypha. This is because the Apocrypha emerges as an identifiable collection, not because of early Jewish, but because of Christian reading practices over the centuries. Which brings us to a second question. What is the Apocrypha? We thought about the books that make up the Apocrypha. What are the Apocrypha? Now, what is the Apocrypha? Jesus, James, and Paul knew at least several of the texts collected among the Apocrypha, but they did not know anything like a collection of Apocrypha. There was no identifiable time at which the emerging Jewish canon of scripture included these books as resources of the highest authority alongside the Torah, the prophets, or the Psalms, despite persistent but mistaken claims about a wider canon out in the Greek-speaking Jewish world. Reading these books as part of the scriptural heritage was a Christian innovation. The separation of these books from the scriptural heritage and the formation thereby of this second tier of resources that could come to be named Apocrypha, same authority as other books of the Old Testament. 
the great Septuagint codices of the fourth and fifth centuries, alongside with giving us some of our earliest complete manuscripts of the New Testament, also show us Christian Old Testaments from the fourth and fifth centuries that include with some variation many of the books of the Apocrypha within the Old Testament. At the same time, Christian voices throughout these same centuries raised serious questions, both about the level of authority that ought to be accorded books not received as canonical by the synagogue, and thus by association by Jesus and the apostles, and about which form of a book ought to be received as canonical in the church. Think, for example, again of the thinner Hebrew version of Daniel or Hebrew version of Esther versus the thicker Greek version of Esther or Greek version of Daniel circulating among the churches. Perhaps the best known and the most respected of these voices was Jerome, the fifth century scholar who created the Latin Vulgate. The voices for a more inclusive Old Testament, among which Augustine was a vocal champion, prevailed in both Catholic and Orthodox circles, though the challenges to this broader canon never disappeared. When the Protestant reformers instituted a new ordering of their scriptures, they were standing in a long line of Catholic and Orthodox Christians who also had held to this minority opinion. And so the books whose place among the canonical scriptures of the Old Testament was disputed, but which nevertheless enjoyed great antiquity of use in the church, were culled from among the Old Testament and began to be printed in a new section between the Testaments as Apocrypha. Many Protestants today are surprised to learn that, despite this action, Several wings of the Reformation continued to hold the Apocrypha in high esteem. Martin Luther himself took the considerable pains to translate these books for inclusion in his German Bible, granted in their new position between the Testaments. Here we see the first page of the new section from the 1545 edition of Luther's Bible, along with his famous and careful description of the Apocrypha as, quote, books that, though not esteemed like Holy Scripture, are nevertheless useful and good to read. He provides prefaces to each of the individual books, weighing the value of each and arriving at a very positive assessment of many. He gives special shout-outs to the importance of reading the Wisdom of Solomon, and first Maccabees. In the preface to Wisdom of Solomon, he writes of its value for spiritual edification. There are many good things in it, and it is well worth reading. This book is a good exposition and example of the first commandment, and that is the main reason why this book is to be read, so that one may learn to fear and trust God, so that he may help us by his grace. In the preface to 1 Maccabees, Luther recognizes its importance as background information for the proper interpretation of a canonical text. He writes, its words and discourses are almost as enlightening as those of the other books of Holy Scripture. And it would not have been wrong to count it as such, because it is a very necessary and useful book, as witness the prophet Daniel in the 11th chapter. For this reason, it is useful for us Christians also to read and know it. The Articles of Religion of the Church of England from 1562 show the Reformation there to have taken essentially the same position as Luther's Reformation on the continent. We read there, the other books, as Hierome, Jerome, saith, the Church doth read for example of life and instruction of manners, but yet doth it not apply them to establish any doctrine. The translators and the publishers of the 1611 King James Version therefore likewise included the Apocrypha, though again in a separate section between the Testaments, 
all the more as readings from several of these books continued to appear in the lectionary cycle of the Church of England, as has been the case to this day. For the first 20 years, every printing of the King James Version would include the Apocrypha until this mandate was relaxed for the sake of printing somewhat more affordable personal Bibles without the Apocrypha. 20% less paper, 20% cheaper. All pulpit Bibles printed for use in the Anglican Church, of course, would necessarily continue to include the Apocrypha. The classification of this collection as the Apocrypha, then, is a product of varying Christian reading practices and canonical decisions. While convenient and useful from our vantage point in church history, it would be entirely anachronistic when considering these books in their early Jewish context. So another question that we could ask would be, how available and how valued were the books of the Apocrypha in Jesus' context? Jesus' contemporaries and near contemporaries did not look only to a canonical core for things good and useful for the pursuit of a God-centered and Torah-observant life. Many valued more recently written compositions very highly if they also served this end. The wisdom of Ben Sira, again, offers an informative example in this regard. Yehoshua Ben Sira committed to writing a considerable sampling of his curriculum, gathered over a lifetime of study and teaching in the late 3rd and early 2nd century BCE in his House of Instruction in Jerusalem. In 132 BCE, his grandson took a Hebrew copy of the grandfather's work to the Jewish community in Alexandria, Egypt, where he translated it into Greek, quote, for those living abroad who wished to gain learning and are disposed to live according to the law. That's in the prologue to Ben Sira. He thus made it broadly accessible to Greek-speaking Judaism. Copies of the Hebrew book continued to circulate throughout Judea. A small fragment from a manuscript of Ben Sira was found among the Dead Sea Scrolls, and the psalm from the end of Ben Sira's work was incorporated into a psalms scroll at Qumran, a fragment several chapters in length, turned up at Masada. His work was therefore known in several Jewish circles prior to the destruction of the Second Temple. Jewish teachers who stood in a line of direct uh, descent from the Jerusalem sage, as it were, continued to read, recite, and reflect on his work. The wisdom of Ben Sira is quoted almost a hundred times in the Babylonian and Jerusalem Talmuds, the Midrashim, and early medieval rabbinic literature, attesting to his wisdom being kept alive in scribal circles so that his voice continued to speak in rabbinic Judaism. Ben Sira's recitation of sacred history in his praise of the ancestors, the hymn to the ancestors that begins with chapter 44, verse 1, and his description of the high priest Simon II emerging from the holy places appear to have left an impression on the synagogue's Day of Atonement liturgy, the Avodah, after the Jewish revolt. Portions of five medieval period copies of his work were found among the manuscripts stored in the Geniza, the storeroom for used up manuscripts, of a synagogue in Cairo. It should not surprise us, therefore, to find Ben Sira's teachings to have left an impression on those who were taught in the synagogues throughout Judea and Galilee, including Jesus, his brother James, and the Jerusalem-trained Paul. We could similarly trace out the literary and manuscript evidence for the popularity of books like Tobit, fragments of five copies of which were also preserved among the Dead Sea Scrolls, or 2 Maccabees, itself inspired by a five-volume history of the Maccabean revolt by a, a certain Jason of Cyrene, disseminated from, Jeru from Judea as part of an effort to involve diaspora Jews in celebrating Hanukkah as early as 124 BC. While some of the Apocrypha do not appear to have exercised nearly the influence in Jewish circles that they would later uh, exercise in Christian circles, 
others were evidently treasured as valuable, edifying literature. Whoops, there's a picture. There's another picture. <sighs> Let's uh, continue and pretty much wrap up with a consideration of selected traces of the Apocrypha in the New Testament. One of the reasons that second and third century Christians might have given so much attention to some of these books that they came to be part of the Old Testament in many Christian circles may be the noticeable impact that some of the books of what we call the Apocrypha had on the writings of the Gospels and the Apostles. The reader of both Ben Sirah and Matthew, for example, noticing that, points, uh, noticing that the points of contact between Ben Sirah and Matthew were almost as numerous and pervasive as points of contact between Matthew and other books of the Jewish canon, began to prize Ben Sirah more highly, to study it more intently, and to bring it more often into Christian discourse. Those texts that appear to have informed the writings of the emerging New Testament came to be valued as resources and eventually valued as authorities for Christians to continue to consult. Ben Sira's impact on Jesus' teachings was profound indeed. We need not think in terms of literary dependence as if Jesus had access to a Ben Sira scroll. A more likely model would be to imagine those who taught Jesus in the synagogue of Nazareth, weaving the more beneficial facets of Ben Sirah's teaching into their own homilies, perhaps not even being aware themselves that this material ultimately came from Ben Sirah, rather than simply from their own immediate teachers. In addition to our earlier exploration of Ben Sirah's and Jesus' teachings on forgiveness, this impact emerges plainly in their teachings on the value of and the motivations for almsgiving. The law of Moses had made charity toward the poor an essential component of covenant loyalty. But Ben Sira specifically and quite distinctively promoted the giving of charitable aid as the wisest manner in which to lay up a treasure for oneself. He writes, for the commandment's sake, help a poor person. Don't send him or her away empty-handed because of their lack of means. Deprive yourself of silver on account of a brother and a friend, and don't allow it to rust under a stone unto destruction. Lay up your treasure according to the commandments of the highest, and it will prove more advantageous to you than gold. Stash away almsgiving in your storerooms, and this will deliver you from every hardship. Jesus' teaching on almsgiving resonates with Ben Sirah at a number of particular points. Jesus also taught that one laid up a genuine treasure for oneself not by hoarding goods, but rather by giving away one's possessions to those in need. The stash of assets that sits idle rather than being used to relieve others' need, ends up profiting no one, being lost to rust, worms, or thieves. Thus we read in Matthew's Gospel, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust consume and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust consumes and where thieves do not break in and steal. Or in Luke's gospel, sell your possessions and give alms. Make purses for yourselves that don't wear out. An unfailing treasure in heaven where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. We might also remember the rich fool who did not store almsgiving in his barns, but just built bigger barns when his older ones were stuffed full. Jesus stands apart from Ben Sirah on one critically important point, however. Ben Sirah, who gave no explicit attention to an afterlife, regarded the practice today of almsgiving to provide one's greatest assurance of help for future adversity in this life, whether the help would come from God or from neighbors who honored and remembered generosity in their midst. 
Jesus, however, anticipates that the rewards for almsgiving would come beyond this life. Such points of connection between Ben Sira and Jesus could be multiplied, showing that Ben Sira contributed significantly to that pool of instruction that Jesus considered valuable and worth incorporating into his own proclamation of the life that pleased God. The contents of the letter of uh, Jesus' half-brother, James, also shows some remarkable connections with Ben Sira. If the instructions contained in that letter trace back to the historical James, as I happen to believe, James's location for the second half of his life at the head of a Jewish sect based in Jerusalem, a hub of Jewish intellectual discourse, would have given him significantly greater occasion to encounter traditions reaching back to Ben Sira, whether knowingly or not, than his upbringing alongside his half-brother in the synagogue of Nazareth. James's warnings about the dangers of the unbridled tongue resonate with the earlier teaching of Ben Sira, who, like James, regarded the careless use of the tongue as a source of ruin. Ben Sira had pointed out the anomaly that one source, the mouth, could produce such opposite effects, fanning a, fl- a fire by blowing into it or extinguishing a fire by spitting into it. James similarly marvels that one source, the tongue, can issue forth opposite effects, namely blessing and cursing, urging that only the former is proper. When James tackles the question concerning the source of temptation, he decisively disallows that God entices people to sin and points rather to human desire and decision. James writes, let no one say when being tempted, I'm experiencing temptation from God. For God is above being tempted by evil things, and God himself tempts no one. Rather, each person is tempted by his or her own desires, being drawn and enticed. This essentially restates Ben Sira's much earlier teaching on the matter. He wrote, Don't say, I fell away on account of the Lord for he will not bring about what he has hated. Don't say, he himself led me astray, for he has no use for a sinful person. He himself created humanity from the beginning and left them to make their own decisions. Both sages also view being tested or tempted, the Greek can yield either sense, as the typical consequence of pursuing a godly life urging their hearers to embrace testing as an opportunity to demonstrate and to cultivate steadfastness. Taken together, such correspondences show that a good deal more of the teachings of Jesus and James stood within the stream of Jewish wisdom instruction than would otherwise be recognized by the person who looks only to the Protestant Old Testament for an inventory of the traditions available to Jesus and to James. Another text that has left its imprint across the New Testament is the wisdom of Solomon. Unlike the wisdom of Ben Sira, whose author speaks in his own voice and his own persona, wisdom of Solomon is written as though in the voice of King Solomon, the patron saint of sages. The author's recollection of his prayer, of Solomon's prayer for wisdom, for example, explicitly recalls the language Solomon had used in, uh, in 1 Kings chapter 3 when he was commissioned to build the temple for God in Jerusalem. Wisdom of Solomon was actually composed in Greek, probably in Egypt during the Roman period, probably during the reign of Augustus Caesar himself. We particularly find points of contact between Wisdom of Solomon and the Pauline circle. Most stunning in this regard are the resonances between Paul's explanation of the Gentiles' fundamental sin of idolatry, giving worship to the created thing rather than discerning the creator behind the splendor of creation as they ought to have done, and the consequences of the same in the disordered vice-ridden lives of these Gentiles. Both authors, Paul and the Wisdom of Solomon, not only display the same topics, but also the same 
argumentative progression. It was indeed possible, both say, for Gentiles to have perceived their creator God through observation of the creation, and so they are left without excuse. Gentiles chose rather to worship created things. Their failure to know the true God led to the proliferation of wickedness within and among them, with murder, theft, sexual perversion, and deceit being specifically named. Finally, God is just to condemn all who practice such deeds. Reading Wisdom of Solomon alongside Paul helps us to appreciate all the more Paul's final twist, where Paul does go that his precursors and contemporaries did not go, namely turning to indict his Jewish hearers, who, like the author of Wisdom of Solomon, would have been in full agreement with Paul up to that point concerning Gentile failure to honor God as God merited. Many readers get the point without the benefit of having read Wisdom of Solomon chapters 13 and 14, but having read these chapters in which a Hellenistic Jewish author gives voice to the same critique of Gentile thinking and practice grounded in Gentile religion, the surprise and the sting of Paul's turn in Romans 2 strikes us all the more powerfully. Like the author of Wisdom, Paul also stresses that God is patient and makes room for repentance, though Paul believes in the potential of Gentiles to repent far more fully than the author of Wisdom of Solomon. Reflection on the figure of wisdom, or the person of wisdom, as this has developed during the Second Temple period, has also contributed significantly to early Christian reflection upon its distinctive faith. Readers of Proverbs, especially Proverbs 8, are familiar with the figure of Lady Wisdom, the personification of wisdom, who was given a soliloquy in which she invites disciples to seek her and speaks of her role alongside God in creation itself. Poetic meditation upon the figure of wisdom continued in the centuries to follow, reaching a high watermark in Wisdom of Solomon. There, um, in the second bullet point, we read, Wisdom, the artisan of all things, taught me. She is the radiance of everlasting light, the spotless mirror of the operation of God, and the image of his goodness. Early Christian theologians seized upon this language to speak of the relationship of the pre-incarnate Son to God, drawing upon wisdom reflection to give expression to their own convictions about Jesus before the Word became flesh. The author of Colossians, for example, speaks now of the Son as the image of the invisible God, attributing to the Son agency in creation and the ordering of creation, the very things formerly attributed to the figure of wisdom. The author of Hebrews, who also stands within the Pauline circle, presents the Son as the radiance of God's glory, stamped with the impression of God's essence. The lavish expansions on wisdom's relationship to God in Wisdom of Solomon provided some of the raw materials for the early church's Christology, its reflection on the person of the Son. Having said so much in favor of the Apocrypha's contribution to early Christian ethics and theology, it is also important to observe the ways in which the New Testament authors do draw upon the material and the ways in which they do not draw upon or present the material. At no point in the New Testament does any author introduce a quotation from any one of the texts now included in the Apocrypha using the formulas typically associated with a recitation of scripture. For example, as it is written, as the Spirit says, as the scripture says. Indeed, at no point is there an explicit quotation of any one of these books, although one can find such explicit recitations of 
unspecified Greek authors, for example, in Paul's speech before the Areopagus in Acts 17. And one even finds a quotation of First Enoch in the letter of Jude. This all suggests that while the New Testament authors were acquainted with and valued these texts as resources and as conversation partners, they did not regard them as of equal weight with the scriptures and therefore did not introduce them as such. I lied, there's another section. The Apocrypha continued to play an influential role in the emerging Christian church. During the second through the fourth centuries, Christians drew more and more upon the books of the Apocrypha as a source for ethical and theological guidance, for inspiration, and for the ideological resources that could help sustain them in their faith. As Christians increasingly faced the prospect of martyrdom toward the late second through the third centuries, the stories of the martyrs who kept faith with God rather than renouncing the covenant in 2 Maccabees 6-7 or in 4 Maccabees became increasingly relevant and useful. Acquaintance with these stories is attested as early as the letter to the Hebrews, chapter 11, verse 35, where the author refers to those, quote, who were tortured, not accepting release, in order that they might obtain a better resurrection. These martyrs' stories came to be retold at length in both Cyprian's and Origen's exhortations to martyrdom as examples of piety and courage to be imitated now by Christians. Long after the edicts of toleration issued under Constantine and Licinius, church fathers like Ambrose, John Chrysostom, and Gregory Nazianzen continue to return to 2nd and 4th Maccabees and to these martyrs, but now as examples of the potential of the pious mind to overcome the passions that wage war against the soul. Christian apologists found the anti-idolatry polemics of the letter of Jeremiah and the wisdom of Solomon to be a source of inspiration in their ongoing work of delegitimating the religious practices that most Christian converts had left behind. You could see this imprint especially on Aristides' apology and Firmicus Maternus on the heirs of the pagan religions, which reproduces parts of these apocryphal texts at some length. At the same time, Christian theologians continued to mine the wisdom of Solomon, wisdom of Ben Sira, and Baruch as they sought clarity on questions like the subordination or the non-subordination of the Son to the Father, or whether or not the Father and the Son are of one being, whether or not the Son is eternally begotten of the Father, questions concerning the two natures of Christ, questions concerning human anthropology. This phenomenon incidentally exposes something of the fallacy of the reformers' insistence that the Apocrypha should not be used for establishing doctrine because some key Christian doctrines had already been established, in part at least, on the basis of these texts by the 4th and 5th centuries. Texts from the Apocrypha also entered quickly into Christian liturgical practice. Notable here are the prayer of Manasseh, that prayer of repentance, and the two additions to the book of Daniel that were inserted into Daniel 3, the story of the, uh, the three young men faced with the trial of the fiery furnace, a prayer of Azariah, a prayer of confession of sin, and the song of the three young men, a celebration of God's power and God's deliverance. These three texts appear alongside other songs and prayers that were culled from the Old and New Testaments in a collection called the Book of Odes in the 5th century Codex Alexandrinus, one of our three great uh, early Christian Bibles. The collection of Odes immediately followed the Book of Psalms in Alexandrinus as a kind of first hymnal supplement in Christian history. The persistence of these liturgical pieces in Christian worship is evidenced by the fact that they continue to appear in the services of morning prayer in the Episcopal Church, the Anglican Church, 
and until recently, uh, Lutheran books of worship. The imprint of the wisdom of Solomon on the liturgy of the Greek Orthodox Church is profound and pervasive. In conclusion then, while Protestant Christians are unlikely ever to revisit the canonical decisions of the Reformation, there are advantages to revisiting and reversing our widespread unfamiliarity with and even disdain for the Apocrypha in many Protestant circles. Readers of the Apocrypha gain a much more accurate picture of the faith and the practice and the challenges of the Judaism into which Jesus was born and within which the early church took shape. As a result, they also gain a clearer perception of the points of agreement and lines of disagreement between the leaders of the Jesus movement, beginning with Jesus, and the various currents within the Judaism of the period. Those who grow in familiarity with uh, these books expose themselves to the resources that significantly impacted the emerging theology, ethos, and practice of the Christian church in its most formative centuries. The texts themselves, however, also have inherent value as witnesses to the faith, the formational practices, and the devotion of the Second Temple period authors who created them and the readers who valued them. Their value as such and their capacity for speaking to their spiritual descendants have been affirmed by the majority of the world's Christians, the Catholic and Orthodox communions across the centuries commending these texts not only for their historical value, but also, at the very least, as the devotional literature that has most stood the test of time in the Christian church. These reasons collectively confirm Martin Luther's own commendation of the Apocrypha for our attention as books that are, one last time, good and useful to read. Thank you for your kind attention. I believe we now have time for questions, discussion. Who, who has a question? I'll start with an easy one, maybe. Um, the, so you've, you've distinguished the Apocrypha from the canonical scriptures. How would you distinguish the Apocrypha from, say, the writings of Oswald Chambers, C.S. Lewis, Scott McKnight, Henri Nouwen? First, I think Scott would be very happy to have been put in that company. <laughs> um, C.S. Lewis has influenced two generations of Christians. The Apocrypha have influenced, I'm just going to guess, 60 generations of Christians. And they were influential at a period uh, that, that, that made Christianity what it is. So while C.S. Lewis's imprint or Scott McKnight's imprint might be on some of us, the imprint of the Apocrypha is on Paul and Jesus and on the bishops who met at Nicaea and Chalcedon, and hammered out the creed that has defined the boundaries of orthodoxy for 17, 16 centuries. So that would be a, an easy way to distinguish them. Thank you. Hi, thank you for your lecture. I learned a lot. Could you say a little bit more about how, how specifically how the these writings influence the um the nicaea and chalcedon like which books and which parts of those books sure. which concepts sure you don't have to get length but just the main things uh, again it's largely language about the figure of wisdom in wisdom of solomon in the book of baruch and to a lesser extent in the wisdom of ben sira but that was a place that uh, Christians could go in the second, third centuries as they're trying to figure out 
um, how Father, Son, and Holy Spirit relate to each other and how, um, how we can still affirm faith in one God while worshiping three persons. So it, it's largely there. And a great resource for those of you who are interested in tracing that out would be uh, the volume on the Apocrypha in the ancient Christian commentary series that IVP Academic published, I think around 2010 or 2011, a Greek Orthodox scholar, Sever Voiku, uh, puts together um, uh, a wonderful resource, about half of which is devoted to Ben Sira, and another thir- uh, quarter to Wisdom of Solomon and Baruch. And there you could trace out you know, how Athanasius and how Augustine and uh, what have you are pulling from these texts to defend what would become the orthodox expression of Trinitarianism, um, yeah, and, and the non-subordinationism, the, the sort of the sidelining of Arius and his, his school. A gentleman over here had his hand up. Thank you. Um, you kind of already answered it, but I'm going to ask again just in case the answer would be different. If we were looking into studying the Apocrypha or consuming the media in some sense, what would you recommend, like us purchase? Consuming the what? The Apocrypha. Oh, okay, like just sure. consuming it in some measure. The first thing you should do is get the Apocrypha. Obviously. And, and probably the best addition to buy is the new Oxford annotated Apocrypha because it's nice to have annotations and introductions when you're delving into an unfamiliar corpus. And you can get used copies dirt cheap on Amazon. Um, and then I would seek out some secondary literature on it. If, if you wanted to go even further, um, I have immodestly recommended some of my own titles on the handout that I gave you, but I'm from New Jersey, and self-promotion goes with the territory. Thank you. Maybe there's time for one more question. If there's one more question. It's a sleepy bunch tonight. That could be my fault. Thank you for uh, speaking tonight. It was a very informative lecture. Um, I was kind of wondering what the difference is between the Apocrypha and more like Gnostic texts from the period, more so like the uh, Gospel of Ter- Thomas or the Gospel of Mary. Yeah. Apocrypha, good. Gnostic, bad. Next question. <laughs> no, sorry. <laughs> sorry. So uh, t- to give a fair question to that, um, the books of the Apocrypha pretty much represent mainstream Jewish thinking, ethically, theologically in terms of the covenant, in terms of God's involvement with covenant observance and and God's people. Gnostic texts, as you all know already, represent um, marginal thinking in the Christian church. Um, So while reading Gnostic texts, and and of of all of them, the Gospel of Thomas is the most innocuous. It's the least Gnostic, Gnostic text out there. So if you gotta read one, read that one. But none of them seem to me to have any value for getting behind them to the teaching of Jesus or the apostles. And they don't seem to have a great deal of value for um, for understanding where the church is going except as it reacts against those Gnostic texts. I mean, we owe a lot to Gnosticism. Irenaeus would never have so carefully uh, uh, defined the boundaries of the faith in his against heresies without the Gnostics, but their value is strictly negative in that sense. It helped the church define why we are not them. Whereas the Apocrypha helped the church define why we are what we are. So it had a positive probative value.
Thank you so much for having me.